Artist Talk and Entertainment 2.0. Here's your host, Jesse Johnson and Liz Werfel. Hello, welcome to another edition of Artist Talk and Entertainment 2.0. I'm Jesse Johnson. And I'm Liz Werfel. We bring to you the what's what. And the who's who in the art world today. These are artists from all sorts of different categories. I first went out to Michigan City and had the opportunity to sit down with Carol Estes. And um, here's what she said. Sometimes uh, what I shoot depends on where I am. Recently, I took a uh, Amtrak trip to uh, Denver. So I learned to shoot out the train window and created some amazing things that had some emotion and flow to them and did that just because I worked within the moment. You talk about the moment. How long was that process in the moment when you're creating something? Sometimes when I'm with a camera and I'm out looking around to do, sometimes uh, something will, it'll just be a flash and you have to capture it because you may be in a car, you may be on the stop on the side of the road, I may be letting my dogs walk, uh, and you see something and you grab the camera because that is the moment. Now, the, a bigger concept sometimes will take uh, weeks and weeks. The, the piece I did for the um, uh, suffrage piece, that took eight months to finally make it so that it was complete because there was a missing link and I couldn't figure out how to make it complete. And uh, so, and just like, it's like a story that you write because I do prose. So it's always a beginning, middle, and the end. And I sit down sometimes and I just say they write themselves because all of a sudden I'm just sitting here doing this. All of a sudden this piece will finish in front of me and that moment has just erupted out. You don't know where it came from. After looking at what Carol creates, I wanted to talk about the moments. Her moments when she really gets lost and involved with her work. It had to come from a previous experience, uh, something I ran into, anything that I had done, something uh, got that to rattle inside me and then it came out with the pen. So you just don't know. When it comes to titles, how do you decide what is the title for a certain given piece? Sometimes it's really a simple thing of uh, where I am and I will get on the computer and uh, I'll, I'll fiddle with the fiddle with it a little bit on the computer, but I'll sit and look at it and see if the story, if there's a story that's or emotion or something that, that speaks back to me. And sometimes there'll just be something that will click in, and then that generally will be uh, be be a title. I really love to title my pieces, and not just locations and where and and what it is. I usually love to go deeper in and and create a kind of little storyline with my pictures and hopefully what I'm seeing in my eye reflects into the title. You know, I feel like uh, Carol got really personal and in-depth about her work and she shared those moments while she's deeply lost in her uh, work. What do you think, Liz? I like when artists are personable and can share some of their personal stories. Reminds me of artist Master Burt. I went out personally to interview Master Burt, who has sickle cell anemia. My name is Master Burt. I'm from Chicago Heights, Illinois. I'm an advocate for sickle cell anemia because I have two children, one with sickle cell, one with the trait. Um, I use art to help me um, get through a lot of the pain that I deal with. I use art. Um, to sometimes it, it, it's, it's a pain manager. I used to just draw all the time. I would draw, do a lot of portraits for people. But once I saw that there was a need for advocacy, uh, I started advocating through my artwork. And with that, I realized that painting could also uh, help me get through some of my pain. What I'm doing now is I'm laying my palette. Uh, a palette is an array of colors that you're going to use to paint with. Uh, you want to try to give them some type of order to the point where you don't get mixed up and be all over the place. Bert says he likes to start off outlining so that he can visually see how it's coming together. You know, 
It depends on how he's feeling whether or not he can paint. Sometimes he chooses to paint in order to move through the pain. Um, there would be times where, you know, it would be a decision to go to the hospital or wait it out or what, and I would just paint. I would paint and that would take my mind away from the pain, which would eventually lessen the pain. So yeah, that's what painting does for me. Young or old doesn't matter. Britt's going to tell us why he created some of his work. I admire artists a lot, you know, because uh, you can learn from each other, man. Like, I'm, I'm never too, I'm never too old to learn, even if it's from somebody younger than me. Michael Jackson is one of my, no, he's one, yeah, one of my favorite um, artists. And the funny part about this is that uh, he's, I have an older cousin, he was his favorite artist, and then me, my favorite artist, and now he's my daughter's favorite artist. And so it just goes to show that the times that, you know, how, how, how his music, it, it lasts. And, uh, and um, I wanted to create this of his childhood. I wanted to create this one of his childhood and also one of him being an adult. And so uh, well, I'm in the process of doing a series of Michael Jackson silhouettes. And um, this one here, it, it reminds me of uh, the Jackson 5 back in the ABC days. And so this is why I wanted to capture this picture like this. Uh, this picture right here was created. Um, I was going through some parental issues with my kid's mother. And, um, so basically I have one, I have uh, two kids, one biological and one not. And uh, my son is not biologically mine, but he's mine. Raised him since he was born. And uh, what happened was that um, I had a uh, temporary custody of him. And uh, he, uh, they gave it back to her. And as soon as they gave it back to her, pretty much, she stopped and made it to the point where I couldn't, you know, uh, see him no more and act with him no more. And uh, this was what came out of it. This was, this was how I was feeling. Uh, this is us. Bert tells us a bit more about his sickle cell painting. So this picture is um, sickle cell, again, advocating, trying to inform people of what's going on, trying to inform people of how other people feel as well as myself with sickle cell. Um, you see the, 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 the medicines, they feel there's a lot of pain medicines, like you get it's flowing from the sky, especially when you're young. It's flowing from the sky just for them to turn around and then call you a, a drug seeker or an addict. Uh, when you go to the emergency room, we pretty much feel like we're in jail. A lot of times when you're in the hospital for months at a time, um, with this is oxygen. If you could uh, even zoom in, you'll see that his eyes are yellow, and uh, that's a cause of yellow jaundice. I wanted to capture the things that really go on within the life of sickle cell. Um, you see here, he's getting a, he got an IV, getting a blood transfusion. Um, and the scream, the scream here, it's a sickle, it's a sickle scream, it's a sickle cry. And so this is why I have the sickle cells flowing out of his mouth because it's sickle cell that's screaming at you when we're in that level 10 crisis. It's sickle cell that's screaming at you when we're hurting and pain like this. That's uh, everything is a state of emergency when, when, when you are dealing with sickle cell because you can go from having a simple cold to acute chest to death. And everything is an emergency when you, when you do deal with sickle cell. You need to get that ASAP. Uh, I gave him a call the other day to see how that painting was going and he had to put it on hold because he's not feeling up to it yet, but I'm sure he's gonna get back to it. I think that was powerful. What do you think, Jesse? Yeah, you know, Liz, I find that very uh, powerful and very interesting in how some artists 
are able to create while they're going through their issue or something like that. Yeah, and it's almost as if those challenges create an even more powerful process and, uh, and a way in which they can be creative through their artwork. I agree, I agree. Let's go to commercial break. Okay, we'll be back. next artist interview is with Kennard Jackson, a resident of Gary, Indiana. Uh, here we are at um, Uncle Hex Candy Shop on 8th and Heverson in Gary, Indiana. This is a piece that was done by a guy, his old friend of mine, his name is Elam. The E and the L is short for Eliminator. I'm going to show you the, um, the letters real quick. This is the E with a, like a downward angle toward it. This is the L right here. You see, I see a lot of graffiti writers, you know, with, um, with crowns. The crown basically symbolizes that you're, um, that you're at the top of your game. It, it really doesn't have to do with nothing about royalty. It's just being at the top of your game, mastering your art. Kennard explained uh, the mural him and a few of his friends had created on 8th and Harrison. It was truly a sight to see all of those beautiful works and they were presented on the fence of a candy store. Jackson's going to break it down for us. This is actually the front end of the Heckles um, candy shop. Big Brother Heck. This is actually a piece that I did a couple of months ago. There's different levels of graffiti art. This is actually just um, one phase, we like to say. This is my name right here, ta-da. And this is the T with the cross. I like to stretch my letters, you know, to um, give it a lot more dynamic. This is the A coming around. This is the D with a stretch arrow. Arrows are real, kind of like historic when it comes to graffiti writing. And this is another A right here. T-A-D-A -A is the way I spell my name. And the funny thing about it, I didn't know that to, um, years ago. My name actually, Tada, actually came from a Bugs Bunny cartoon. This is one of the many styles that I do. Again, my name is Tada Kenai Jeff. He also decided to take us to the spot where the building was torn down on the outside, remember? Yeah, and then the other side is where he demonstrated how to do a fill-in. Let's watch. This is what you call in graffiti a fill-in. I'm going to do this real quick, okay? This is kind of illegal. Have to get the crown. Switch to my other cap. The outline. A throw up. That's the throw up team. Stand for ta -da. We'll be back after this commercial break.
Maybe. Here's the candy. You fine? Better? Better. Are you hungry? Snicker. The meal that satisfies. I have someone interesting you should really know. Well, tell me more about them. Well, her name is uh, Bridget Covert from South Shore Arts. She's a director and a curator. She's also a photographer. And um, she, you know, had the opportunity to give me a tour of the facilities and uh, show me one of the exhibitions there. Hi, my name is Bridget Covert and I am the director of exhibitions here at South Shore Arts, our main campus located at the Center for Visual Performing Arts in Munster, Indiana. We are here in our main gallery right now. This is our um, one of our largest galleries. It's a 5,000 square foot space um, in Munster right off of Ridge Road. We also have two satellite campuses in Hammond and Crown Point. Um, where we do exhibitions and have classes and all sorts of fun things to um, be involved in the arts with. Um, the building that I'm located in right now and the gallery that I'm located in right now is our biggest and um, most visited gallery. Uh, the show that's behind me is our 76th annual salon show, the first which started in Hammond at a hat shop 76 years ago. This year's juror is David Clayman from Indiana University and uh, he chose all the artwork for us. He had to go for, he had to look through all of the images that were submitted. So 361 different submitted pieces and he dwindled it down to 61 pieces. Um, after he dwindles it down, we are, he selects a few that win prizes. Uh, my job here is to, with this show, kind of curate it, lay it out, um, make sure it has like a good vibe and flow and uh, the work is hung well. And that's what I do in most of our spaces. Every once in a while I curate the shows completely by uh, choosing the theme and choosing the work, the artist, and laying out the show and kind of changing the space. We have about six different spaces that I do that for, um, from a cafe to a theater, another theater out in Hammond, and, and then our, also our satellite spaces. As Cooper shares her personal stories about her work, she opens up to a degree of confidence and assurance about the quality of the time her own work. I started as a portrait photographer and a wedding photographer and although I still love doing those things, my favorite thing to photograph is landscapes. Um, I have such a love of just kind of going out and finding different uh, moments with the sun playing and the clouds playing and uh, photographing kind of stills that you don't get to see all the time. This is a photograph I took a few years right behind me. Um, it's of a sunset in Cedar Lake, Indiana, um, a few minutes from where I grew up in. And um, this one is probably very, I don't know, dear to my heart just because uh, it shows kind of new growth in kind of like the dead of uh, what happened in the winter. And also I would just, this is a place I'd frequent all the time driving on my bike and kind of um, doing that thing, those kind of things, and I always would take a camera with me when I was riding my bike around uh, rural parts of Indiana, and that's really when I got more involved with photography, and I had started out with just kind of like a little point and shoot, and realized that I wanted this to be more serious, and kind of started getting my equipment uh, upgraded and whatnot. I started as um, a painter, and in college I was a painter, and went into photography after that and I think that learning painting and also the other aspects of art and learning composition and framing and lighting and all that kind of stuff has a huge role in the way I like to shoot and the way I like to do my photography. I had the opportunity to ask Bridget who were some of the other artists that displayed their work, exhibit their work at the other galleries they own. Besides at this location, we've had so many fantastic artists show at our other locations. We've had a range of artists at our substation number nine and our Artful Garden Crown Point location. At substation number nine, last year we had Jesse Johnson with his solo show Harmony, and that was last summer. And this summer we did Joe Rowan, Unlikely Musical Instruments. And we just did a show that was Julio Guerrera, Gallery of Voices. He was a comic artist. Come visit us at South Shore Arts. We are located, our main campus is at 1040 Ridge Road in Munster, Indiana. You can find more information about all the exhibits at all of our locations, at all the classes we offer from ages uh, 2 to 99 um, at www.southshoreartsonline.org. Jesse, our last interview is with Simone Hayes. She can show us her talent in this video interview. 
I'm Simone Hayes and I'm going to tell you about my process. Let's go on down to the ceramic room. I'm, we're gonna, I'm going to change my clothes and then we'll get thrown. Down I like to start my day off with uh, going over to the and turning on the music because, you know, it's like dead quiet in there like crickets. So the process of throwing, getting to the wheel, starts with wedging clay, getting a ball of clay, uh, picking what kind of clay you want to work with, and in this case I worked with porcelain, and so what I did was I got a ball of clay, and I, sometimes you can measure it, you don't have to, but you wedge it, and wedging um, gets out the air bubbles, uh, makes the clay come together closer, and prevents, you know, cracking. And so, what I did, it, wedging is like kneading dough, but with clay. So, uh, you would do that about a hundred times. And then, after that, you would take your ball of clay over to the wheel. And at this time, you either have set up your wheel before you wedge the clay, or you set up the wheel after, well, that, which is okay. And so, what's best is to put your ball of clay in plastic so it doesn't create a coat over the clay so it's not difficult to use and it doesn't dry out on you. But after you do that, you um, have your water there, you have your tools. Um, in this case, I think I used a uh, wooden tool, a needle tool, a wooden rib, and sponges. And they all have different purposes in how you shape and get rid of clay off of the piece that you're trying to make. I'm inspired to create because I like making functional pieces of art that I can use and other people can use as gifts and whatnot. And it's just something really cool and homemade and something that you can't find anywhere else. If I sat down in a day for about a few hours, I can make about five or six pieces, depending on how big they are or how small. I'm about to get this bad off. You can use your fingers, but you don't want to dig all the time, so I use my metal rib, and it's a nice little trick. You just slide it under there, and it just comes right. Done. Now, I'm about to go here. opportunity to create something for yourself on the wheel and of course for me <laughs> not this time but next time I will okay uh, that's going to be it for artist talk and entertainment 2.0 we'll see you next time bye for now bye bye next time on artist talk in entertainment 2.0 Jesse sits down with artist Mindy Marie and Liz speaks with Georgia Fox and our special guest host, Destiny Briscoe, takes you in the kitchen with Yu Song, who teaches us how to eat healthy. I'm your announcer, Zach Collins. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram.